And pleased to be joined on the Sports Spectrum Podcast, first of all, with my co-host. I like this. <laughs> this is Wesley Woodyard from the Tennessee Titans. Wes, what's going on? Uh, not much, man. Just enjoying great company with some of my brothers up here. Putting that uh, broadcast boot camp, you know, experience to, to work with this uh, podcast. You know it, laying a lumberjack down everywhere I go. Lumberjack <laughs> down. Well, why don't you introduce our guests? So, man, we are here proud proud owner of a new Super Bowl ring. But <laughs> <That's laughs> well, we are here with the McCourty brothers, Devin and Jason McCourty's uh, fresh up a Super Bowl victory, but uh, most importantly, man, my brothers in Christ. Yeah. Welcome to the show. I uh, appreciate guys. you guys having me, man. I got a chance to play with the Lumberjack in Tennessee for a few seasons, so mm -hmm. um, him asking me to come on here was an easy choice. Huh? So, Dev, uh, this is where we're going. <laughs> you guys don't do much alone. I mean, you're usually together quite a bit. We took advantage of this year. Uh, even things we got asked to do separately, I would decline if they said he couldn't come or vice versa. <laughs> I love that. Uh, it's, listen, it's been a month basically since the Super Bowl victory. Um, been somewhat of a whirlwind for you both. So I'll start with this. Just championship parade, trip to ESPN, courtside Lakers Celtics. We were talking about that beforehand. The Grammys. Devin, uh, describe what it's been like these past few weeks now, uh, commensurating at this conference and where we're, we're here learning about Christ and kind of growing in our faith, but what this whirlwind has been like these last few weeks. You Devin, know, start with you. You know, it's crazy. I would say like this whole year kind of started down here. Um, you know, you talk about like two different seasons, but like tough endings, like him being in Cleveland last year and going 0-16, yeah. and then us making it to the Super Bowl and losing to the Eagles, and us coming down here um, to PAO for the first time and like coming almost as like a family. Um, and like each time we get our break and we go to uh, each other's room because we had the kids with us and we talk about what we went through. They talked about how rough it was during the season. And I remember like being down here and just praying like, man, it'd be awesome if we could play together this year. Like, it'd be awesome. And seeing all of that, you know, kind of take its course in the next month. And then, you know, back in you know beginning of February to win a Super Bowl. And um, I think just the whole way we just kept talking about the moments, man. Don't miss these moments, how cherished it was to be, how awesome. And, and then winning the Super Bowl and it was like, he was like, man, I'm going to every Super Bowl thing they got. Parade, <laughs> Bruins game, Celtics game, Grammys. Um, it. it was just like riding, you know, this unbelievable wave that um, when we were down here just a year ago and praying for it, like we never would have imagined that a season would go like how it went. You know, I, even if you take away the Super Bowl, just all of the time we spent spending Thanksgiving together, spending Christmas morning together, um, all of those things that I would say – we kind of knew we was missing, but didn't really know we were missing out over the last 10 years of playing in different cities and not doing it together. Yeah. Um, like we didn't realize how special it was waking up with all the kids and why, and getting to do all of those things this year. Uh, I would say the ending was like uh, kind of, for me, it was kind of bittersweet knowing like, damn, we don't know how this is going to shake, you know, in the future, but uh, it was a lot of fun. How about you, Jay? Yeah. Um, me and my wife could probably do a podcast alone <laughs> on coming here last year at Which PAO. Which we can do that, but <laughs> <Yeah. you are. laughs> Coming here last year at PAO and where we were um, as a team, as a couple, compared to coming back here this year where we were. And I just remember just kind of piggybacking off what Dev said of coming down here to PAO and myself didn't really want to come. And um, it was a trying season for us in our life, not just football, but yeah. – um, playing in Tennessee for eight years, getting released about 10 days before the draft, um, dealing for me individually with that of um, dealing with failure, being told you're not good enough, also having to be a father, being home throughout most of off season training, training on my own. I'm hitting Dev up like, send me what I do every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm out on the field, on a high school field at Brentwood Academy in Tennessee, running by myself every day. And just kind of what we went through in that and it carried over to, all right, we get picked up in Cleveland. We head to Cleveland. Uh, my daughter was just born at the end of February. And now we're in Cleveland. My wife is at home with 
Uh, our then five-year-old uh, son was about to turn two in December, and then daughter, who was still a few months old, yeah. who was struggling with allergies, eczema, and the whole nine. And mm. throughout the course of that season, you know, obviously we're 0-16. Um, there's issues everywhere um, from a football standpoint for me. And my wife's at home, and she's dealing with uh, our youngest daughter who won't sleep through the night and the other two kids and them having to transition. And we were just button heads the entire season. And it really wasn't until we came down here. And like Dev said, we had our breaks, and our and it was done for the night. We'd be up in that room, and uh, for people that have been out here at PAO, we always talk about PAO babies, and uh, <laughs> this is just a mountain high experience and bringing you closer. For us, when we got back to that room, it was like more like more button heads of interpreting what we had just heard, and uh, I just remember going through these few days down here and leaving in a much better place than when we first got here. And like Dev said, it just carried over. You know, the trade happens in March. Yeah. We head up to New England, and we're in a much better place transitioning the second time than we did the first time. We're closer to family. Mm -hmm. um, his wife's across the street. We already go there. Kenny Britt, a guy who I play with, him and his wife's there. My wife, we have a family we also know. So it was just, it was, it was so much fun, you know, such a blessing uh, to be there and to be in my 10th year to go through that experience with my twin brother to win football games and do things I hadn't done in my career. Um, I was the I was the newbie to it, so I was the guy that was always excited. <laughs> um, whatever game we played, when we won, I'm yelling, I'm screaming. I see I see Dev over there shaking his head like <laughs> you're not used to this. So I'm used to this. So I mean, it's kind of that relationship of yin and yang. And me and you, we were teammates, like you said, a few years in in uh, Tennessee, and it's almost like you face adversity and you continue to keep going, whether that was an injury, whether that was a release 10 days before the draft. And, you know, a lot of guys face that same situation, but sometimes we can get lost and disconnected. And I would just like for you to share, like what was the consistent thing that kept you focused and kept you grounded on the main goal? And that was just being a successful father and a successful role model. Man, when you say lost at times, that's how I felt. Like when I got to Cleveland um, throughout that season, I was playing some really good football. And um, sometimes I think that mass of yeah. what we're really going through and what our real struggles were. And my season in Cleveland, I, I was I was doing life on my own. Mm. Um, in Tennessee, I had my nucleus. I had my network. I had um, our team chaplain, Reggie Pleasant, who uh, was kind of holding me accountable. Even if it was just coming to me and asking me a question, I, it would make me think more. And then going to Cleveland, it was just different. You had to readjust, get re comfortable to pe with people. And um, I wasn't doing the same things I was doing to yeah. stay in the word and to, and to be uh, always striving to get closer to God. And I, I wasn't doing anything I would you would perceive from a worldly view was wrong. I wasn't going out to the club. I, I was at home every night. I was being a father. I was helping uh, what I was thinking I was helping my wife, yeah. but I really yeah. was. But I was doing it all on my own. I wasn't waking up praying or reading a Bible or getting into devotionals or different things we did in Tennessee, like our daily bread and questioning each other to make sure we were reading it. I wasn't doing those things. And it wasn't until I got here mm -hmm. at PAO at the end of the year where it kind of hit me. And it was just like, that was my missing piece. Yeah. That's why that year was a struggle for me. And I think coming into the next year, that was what made the transition so much better for me. I remember getting traded and flying to New England, and one of the people I met with was a team chaplain, Jack Easterby, who I had met. Uh, he uh, officiated Dev's wedding. So I already had not a relationship with him, but just had met him before. And we sat down that day, and I told him one of the things that sh I struggled with the most was trying to do it on my own right. uh, while I was at Cleveland. Didn't go to every chapel service, something I had been doing for years. Yeah. And um, throughout the season in New England, I think that was a change for me. I found people that were going to hold me accountable, whether that was doing devotionals with Dev, uh, a guy like Matt Slater, who's always going to question. Much respect. Wh whatever, whatever. <laughs> it, Much respect. He's God, always yeah. going to question. You come in there and talk about something you buy, he's going to be coming from across <laughs> the room. You're living in excess. And, and having those people going to Bible study every Monday, going to chapel every Saturday, that held me accountable and kept me uh, doing the right thing. And that's a great point that you bring up because, you know, a lot of guys don't realize when you transfer and go to a new team, like, you forget those little small things mm -hmm. that you had at your previous team because you're so used to doing mm -hmm. it every day. So, Dev, like for Jason to come to a locker room that you help build and help, you know, put in that faith based, you know, that ground right there. Like how could you speak how important it is for guys that might hear this podcast that 
you know, hey guys, it's important that we embrace and that we set up something for guys coming into our team to be able to continue their path uh, of righteousness and, and their, walk, their walk in Christ. I tell people that all the time, I think it's one of the things people overlook the most, the locker room. Yeah. Um, you see how teams play, you see the finished product on Sunday, you see the practices and how hard everybody works, but people don't see how much guys pour into each other within that locker room. Um, and I don't care if you believe in this or believe in that, guys just genuinely care about each other. Um, and I remember when I first got into the NFL and kind of doing things my own way, um, I always would look and I'd be like, man, like I'm not, I'm not like Slate, man, like someday, I'm going to get there. You know, yeah. I'm going to be more like Slate. I'm going to be more like Gerard May. I'm going to be more like those guys. I just got to keep working. And I remember I went to, uh, like, my, my first chapel in the off season. I was like, man, I'm just going to go. Um, and I remember one of my first ones, uh, Nate Solder. Nate was in there, and Nate talked about um, having testicular cancer mm. um, and going through that. And Nate was talking, and I'm like, man, Nate, like, he got to be just yeah. crushing my – and they say, I'm not worried. You know, God's got me. This is just something we're going through. And I felt, I'm sitting there like, man, like, Nate don't, I'm like, Nate don't care. Yeah. Like, he just said cancer, he don't care. And then Hudson, his son goes through cancer. And and still, you know, Nate's like, yeah, I mean, we, and I'm sitting there like, man, like, this dude is unbe like, I, I'm missing something. Like, I don't, I don't need to be perfect. Like, I just need to keep going. And I think from that point on, I was like, man, I need, guys need to see this throughout all of us. You know, mm -hmm. not just Matt, not just Nate, not just, we need to get as many guys as possible in this so that maybe it's a guy that is a DB and was one offer and he was like, man, Dev's story is just like mine. I need to just pick his brain. Hey, Dev, what you about to go do? I'm about to go to chapel. Yeah. And they like, all right, I'm coming too. Um, and I think that's what's so incredible about the locker room because even though we're all peers and a lot of times we're competing against each other, like we all have so much respect and admiration for each guy and, and we get to see them go through different things um, that really help shape us. And, uh, you know, the relationships built in that locker room, I think, have so much to do with the finished product that a lot of people, unless you're in the locker room, don't really understand. Devin and Jason McCordy are our guests here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast with Wesley Woodyard. I'm Jason Romano. I got to ask you guys, because I have two brothers. And my bond with my brothers is it, you can't touch that, even no matter how much my little brother might mess up sometimes. <laughs> and I'm just sick in my head, like, what is he doing? My, my middle brother is my hero. He's a pastor. He's a doctor, a Bible teacher, a Bible professor. So I love those guys very much. But they're, and I watch you guys, and you seem to be your, each other's biggest cheerleaders. Yeah. And even on, on the level of the Super Bowl, and the play that you make, Jay, obviously that was the big, highly publicized play. It saved the game a lot. Biggest of defensive say. play of the game. There I it is. Say. Biggest <laughs> defensive play of the game. Absolutely. I, even watching you cheer him on. And at the end of the game, there seemed to be even more joy in, in you than him because you were so happy for him. Even at, there's that video on NFL Films at the AFC Championship game <laughs> about you grabbing him. <laughs> we're going. You're going. It's like it just felt like there was a sense of joy there between you two because listen I have brothers they drive me nuts sometimes they're knuckleheads but the bond that you guys you guys don't do a whole lot separately you have that bond it seems like you've had that forever can you just talk about the brotherly bond forget football for a second forget you know all the accolades just the brotherly bond that you two have Dev I'll start with you yeah I think you know our relationship really starts with our mom um, I think anytime you're twins you're together all the time like from the beginning, you get dressed alike. Um, you might have different name tags at times, whether it be a string or something on a finger. Um, but I think as you start hitting different ages, you grow up, the world and everybody else around you is like, man, that's cool, y'all so similar. Hey, what happens when you go against each other? Yeah. Um, and I think that started happening, you know, ASAP for us, mainly in sports. In sports. Yeah. Um, but really, anytime in school, you know, whether it be teachers trying to figure us out, and you know, well, what is you? What do you do good, and what do you do bad? And my mom used to always tell us that no matter what happens, you always got to be aligned together. Uh, you can, I mean, like we're like any boys that grew up together. She said, you can fight and do it all you want inside these walls, right. whether it be video games or one-on-one -on -one basketball outside. She said, but when you get in public, don't let people see you guys go against each other. Mm. Um, and I think probably starting with the fear from her that we didn't want to <laughs> make her mad um, enabled us to grow a bond that, 
talks talk every day, um, can go back and forth with each other like someone's never seen. And, and people have, like our teammates have been around us, whether it be in the off season, we working out and um, I'll tell a quick story. Like we're working out uh, after my rookie year, I make the Pro Bowl. Um, and I think we're doing pull-ups or pull-ups. Pull ups. And I'm like, man, I'm done. And he was like, man, keep going. I was like, man, pull He didn't hit the desired number for the workout. And I was like, man, pull-ups not going to get you to the Pro Bowl. And he was like, and we just start going at like we're like all our guys from Rutgers uh, think we about to fight. And an hour later, we laughing and joking together because that's just what we know. Like. As bigger fans, we also know what the best looks at looks like from each other. So we're gonna push each other that way too. Yeah, Jay. Yeah, it's it's an unexplainable bond, and yeah. um, throughout our careers, we've always talked every day. Uh, we're playing a division of a, a opponent his, in his division. He's screenshotting me his notes or doing whatever. <laughs> um, and to be on the same field, uh, it was so special to be in the meeting rooms. Um, to know that he was a captain since his second year, but to see up close what that looks like, to hear the way the coaches in the building spoke about him. For me coming in, it was it was just so cool. And um, throughout our careers, a lot has been made. And it was just like, man, like you've played nine years. You've never made the playoffs. Your brother's been to the Super Bowl at that time four times. You've gone every year. You've never been able to even sniff the playoffs. Like how, how do you deal with like jealousy and and it's just like you'd say to people, just like you have a person that you've grown up with that you can remember waking up early in the morning for Pop Warner games and going over your plays and talking about being on this stage. And I was just like, for me, I've never been able to get there. And it's obviously team, a team, team sport. And we haven't been able to get over that hump. I'm like, if you couldn't get there, the next best thing for me has been to been able to watch Dev do that. Yeah. now three times and be a part of it for one but to go when he went to the Pro Bowl his rookie year I was right there with him uh, every year he's gone to the Super Bowl I've been down there hosting the family and yeah. um, that's just been our bond and I think this year has been very special for us because throughout we've always helped each other grow but being able to be there um, we did couple study uh, couples Bible study every Thursday together with our team and um, this year we started doing devotionals right on the Bible app together. Uh, me and him will start a devotional and do it. Then we'll start one with me, him, and both of our wives. Mm -hmm. And right in it, we're common and we're going back and forth. And just being able to hold each other accountable up close. And not only through, we can do that being thousands of miles away, but being able to hold each other accountable of what you're saying, what you're doing, what you're looking at. Um, having somebody that you can say anything to, yeah. that they're not going to take it the wrong yeah. way, right. um, it's a special bond. And that's I, I spoke to you guys at the Super Bowl about having that brother mentality of iron sharpens iron mm -hmm. and, and brother sharpens brother. And I was able to capture, well, I cap captured one, but I saw two moments that really just touched me in my heart. One was when you guys knew you were going to win the Super Bowl and you guys eventually found each other and just yes. ran and hugged. And it was just like, I'm up at the last the last seat in the stadium, and I saw that, and all my little coworkers they're laughing. Ah, oh, you just you just been this. I'm like, nah, bro, that's a special moment. But to me, the special moment that I really saw was when I saw your daughter Lily picking up the confetti and was like, oh, this is my confetti. This is my confetti. So, <laughs> as as fathers, like we want to like we want our kids to be happy, man. And, and to me, to see that moment, like see your daughter finally. Live, get a chance to live with her cousin scene, man. I know to me that just touched your heart. So, oh, man, man. Uh, the video she's saying more confetti, more <laughs> confetti, and um, and it was so nerd. They didn't go to any games during the season. My daughter Tennessee started doing fire during the warm ups at games, and ever since they did the fire, <laughs> she hated going to football games. So yeah. she didn't go to any games this year. She loved being at home with the babysitter. So that was her first game of the season, the Super Bowl. So my wife one. was <laughs> nervous on how they were going to act, and all three of them did well. But um, we posted a video on Instagram of my mom doing confetti angels and Liana, my six year old is right next to her. Next to her is my Kate and my three year old. Then my daughter Kai comes running over who's gonna be two at the end of the month. And Dev's oldest London, who's 11 days younger than Kai, come running over and there's a video. Dev's youngest is Brady. He's only nine months. He couldn't He couldn't get down in the confetti. <laughs> mm -hmm. But all of them are just in the confetti doing their own forms of, yeah. uh, of snow angels. Yeah. It looks a little, my mom's not moving her legs, just her arms, but we, they can all <laughs> use some work on technique. But um, 
winning that game and just what we do means so much to us, we think, but means so much more to the people around us that support us. And being able to be down there on that field with Dev in Arizona when he won the Super Bowl and thinking like how special that was when celebrating with him, but then moving kind of to the background to allow him to celebrate with his teammates, yeah. to fast forward to me now being able yeah. to do that alongside him with even more family members down there because you get a little bit more field passes, <laughs> you get more tickets and all of that. Oh, it was just a moment I'll never forget. You know, they teach you in broadcasting, Wes, to uh, never bury the lead. Um, <laughs> and I'm burying the lead completely as we're 22 minutes into this interview. <laughs> Devin, are you going to play next year? Because that's a lot of people are going to wonder about that. And there was some talk, oh, he might retire. And I know that I don't even think you ever said that. You were just said, like, I think every player West too, probably, right? In the words of Jason, I think you say he's been a drama queen. Drama queen. <laughs> drama queen. <laughs> but you always want to see what the next year is like. you got to see how your body, you know, responds and all that. But are you going to play in 2019? Yeah, I'm going to play. you going to play? Um, I think it was just cool um, at this point now, like being down here and seeing. Um, I think you get so wrapped up in the season. And I'm just like, you know, at that point, uh, that was um, media night where Dion said that to me. And it's yeah. like – yeah, man, like if we win a Super Bowl, like I don't know what else could top that. And I think like in that moment, I kind of forgot like, man, I don't play this game just to win Super Bowls. Like it's so much more yeah. that comes from me playing the game that I love. Um, and I think once you get a chance to step away for a couple of weeks now, you're like, yeah, man, like I still do want to be around these other young guys that come in. Um, having uh, this dude, A.J. Moore, came in last year from uh, uh, Mississippi. Oh, nice. And he had a twin brother, C.J. So A.J. came out first, and then C.J.'s coming out this year. Sounds familiar. <laughs> and he was like, and I and I go to him, I'm like, yeah, man, like Tiki and Aranda, that was, you know, like we loved him. And he was like, I don't know them. Oh, I'm like, that made what? You guys I'm feel like, old. what? And he was like, yeah, man, ever since we were in college, like we saw y'all's story. And we was like, man, we want to be like the McCordys. And I sat there like, it's powerful. first, like you said, I was like, damn old. Yeah. But I said, man, like me playing football is doing something. You know, it's doing more than just winning games and winning Super Bowls. Because I told people, I remember me and Nate Soder had that, uh, that conversation um, after we won our first Super Bowl. And both of us had been on the team in 2011 when we lost and losing the AFC Championship twice. And we finally won it. And we was like, and it's this feeling like, man, when you win the Super Bowl, like, and then, like, I remember coming in April, and the first thing you hear from Bill is, like, how much you suck and how much last year didn't matter. <laughs> yeah. And it kind of made you realize, like, man, if you play this game only for Super Bowls, you're going to be very empty. Because, uh -huh. like, as soon as you win it, it's all about how you can win it next year. Yeah. And if you win it again, it's like how you can – like, I've been five times and won three times, and all anybody cares about is if we win a seventh championship for New England organization. Right. So, like, you have to play for so much more. So I love being able to just step away – um, and being down here this week and then, you know, next week going to do a football camp in Puerto Rico with the family mm. um, really starts to make you realize the platform that you get to use uh, to do some special things. So speaking of, we want to stay on that platform level. Uh, congratulations on being the first brother to ever win the Super Bowl. And yeah. this has get elevated you guys' platform. You guys already had a platform, but one of the, the reasons why I respect you so much is the work that you do in the community mm -hmm. and with the sickle cell, and, you know, I just would like for you to expound on what you guys, why, and why, why is that cause so dear to you? Yeah, um, this this is the Super Bowl win um, was very special this year. The, uh, the, obviously, the journey, but uh, our sickle cell campaign started, um, I guess, seven eight years ago now. But uh, our aunt, um, she had sickle sickle cell disease, and um, I have an uncle who actually has sickle cell disease as well. But I grew up very, we grew up very close to our aunt. And, uh, my father passed away when we were three years old uh, from an asthma attack that led into a heart attack. And my connection to that side of the family um, kind of died yeah. with him. And my grandparents did a great job before they passed away of incorporating us along with my Aunt Winifred. And um, when my grandparents passed away, um, my grandfather passed away when I was in fifth grade and my grandmother passed away uh, when we were in college. And 
my Aunt Winnie throughout all of that. As my grandparents got older, she was our connection and she was helping us to come to Orlando to visit them. And um, she'd come around on graduations, whatever it was, hey, let's go out to eat. Whatever it was, she was always there and she never had her own children, but um, she always was trying to be a, a, an asset to us. And yeah. we watched her battle through that disease her entire life. And um, as it took her eyesight away from her, forced her to be on oxygen 24 seven, kept her in and out of the hospital. Every time I talked to my aunt, she was talking to me about God. Mm -hmm. She was a Jehovah's Witness and she be believed in Jehovah God, but her faithfulness. Yeah. And yeah. Um, she passed away uh, January 4th um, during our bye week uh, before we played the Chargers. And me and Deb flew to Orlando. And um, I guess weeks prior to that, we played Miami, uh, down in Miami late December and got a chance to see her. And unbeknownst to us, on her ride back uh, from Miami to Orlando, told her friend that was traveling with her um, that that was probably going to be the last time she saw us. And mm. um, that hurt. Like, that weekend leading up to that game, um, that was rough for us. That hurt. And um, she didn't care about football at all. Didn't didn't care about it. Um, wanted, wanted to talk to us every year about retire. retire. <laughs> <laughs> you played long enough. You made money. It's a dangerous sport. Yeah. Um, but her knowing last year that we were together, she believed in family and she believed in God. Like that, that was it. That was those were the things that were important to her. And every time she talked to me, um, she was witnessing to me. And I remember talking to her as uh, she started to talk about um, wills and all of that. And she would always tell me the pain I'm suffering here one day will be gone. And that gave me peace and comfort in it. Mm. But that just made the sickle cell stuff just so important to us this year. Um, she lived to see 69 years when at the age of 10, she was told she wouldn't see 35. So wow. um, that's our motivation and inspiration behind everything sickle cell that we do. That's yeah. good. Uh, let me ask you real quick, Jay. Uh, I have a couple more questions about you're a free agent. Mm -hmm. And obviously, I think perfect world scenario, Dev, you can jump in here. You want to have him back, right? <laughs> Why not come back? I mean, he's been right. he's been. Seasons where he's won two games, three <laughs> games, none, zero games. Hey, we'll, I mean, we'll, we'll, I mean we'll we'll we, a part of something. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah. If we, if we, we could come to, to the Patriots too, you know. So I'm just saying, like, are you? Is this awkward during this time for you, Jay? Because you're a free agent, or is it? Is it just like business, and you let it kind of um, happen? It was. It was awkward for me when I got released in Tennessee. It was uncharted territory. Yeah. And um, for me now. I don't even think about it, to be honest. Like, there's times it comes through my mind. Uh, but for me right now, like, been out here with my wife here at PAO. We're really enjoying this. We're having a good conversation. Yeah. When we get back home, um, get to be back around the kids. And like Deb said, we'll be leaving for Puerto Rico. Uh, for me, obviously, I would love to be um, back in New England. That would obviously be uh, my first choice. And um, obviously, now playing 10 years, crazy to say that yeah. um, you realize there's obviously a business side to all sure. of it and I'm a big believer that I'm going to pray on it and at the end of the day it'll all work out the way it's supposed to work out so uh, we'll see what happens with it. Dave you brought up an interesting point about how your identity isn't in winning the Super Bowl and like real quick like what's some good advice to a young guy who might come into the league and they're just like mm -hmm. oh it's all about football all about winning I got to win the Super Bowl like for a guy that's, you said, played in five, one, three, what's the best advice for a guy to, t to keep a young guy grounded? Um, I would tell him, you got to work your butt off in football. But to truly be happy and find the things that you want to find to satisfy you, it's going to always be outside of football. Mm. Um, I've even said that to guys on our team. Like, we have rookies, say, you know I mean, he go home, say he's asleep by 8 o'clock, and he don't leave the facility till 7 o'clock. And he don't watch no TV. He don't read. He just sleep, come back in the facility at 5 a.m. And I'm like, hey, man, like, if you want to do that for a week or two, like, that's good. Or yeah. do that. And I said, but, like, when you get off time, like, when we get Tuesday off or we get the bye week, I'm like, you got to start digging into some other things. Like, be grounded in, in different things. He was a guy go to chapel with us every – so he had that. But I, I think when you first jump into the NFL – Everyone's like, man, football is this, football is that. It's so competitive. And you're like, man, I just got to rearrange and just make football here. And I tell guys, you'll have this huge letdown um, at some point. You know, like, I don't know when it'll happen. It could be you get released, you could get hurt. Like, I don't know when. I'm like, but if it's just football, yeah. um, it, it'll hit you and it'll rock you pretty hard. And uh, a guy like Gerard Mayo, I kind of learned that from who was, you know, rookie of the year in 2008, Pro Bowls. 
he gets hurt mm-hmm. at, in, you know, 14, gets hurt, in, no, gets hurt at 13, 14, and 15. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I'm done. Like, mm-hmm. I'm done. I don't want to play no more. And it's a guy that I'm sure people probably thought he played 15, 16 years yeah. and played eight years. And, you know, now he's top of the business world, making money. <laughs> and it just go like, because he said, like, when he got hurt, it taught him, like, man, I got to start sending these emails, yes. people I met. Yes. Um, and that just shows, like, being grounded because, like, you don't always got time to fall. Like, he was a guy, you know, three kids, married, like, you got other people that depend on you to be the leader of the household. You don't have time to just fall when it's just football, football, football. Yeah. Uh, you want to spread your wings like any other person. That's great, man. It's uh, always like we've been hearing this whole week. You're you're not an athlete that happens to be a Christian. You're mm-hmm. a Christian that happens to be an athlete. And that's a, a great, great picture right there. What would you say? Like, what's the best way for a young guy to reach out to an older player? Oh, man. Uh, first and foremost, I, say, I remember going to a symposium and hearing Mike Tomlin talk. And he said, uh, rookies, when you get in the building, shut up. <laughs> and uh, I think that was one of the best advice that you can get. And I remember um, getting there my rookie year. And I remember thinking uh, I had been with my now wife since my sophomore year in college. And I didn't get to the NFL and go crazy or anything. But I just remember even mindset-wise as men, I got to the NFL. And I'm thinking, like, you know, by the time you hit 30, as you get older, you start to settle your mind down and mm-hmm. you start to relax and then you want to become a family man. And I remember getting to the NFL and getting in the locker room and start listening. I didn't talk a lot my rookie year. I was just listening. And I was just like, man, there's great examples in here of great men. Yeah. And there's terrible examples <laughs> of what you want to be. And the great examples range from guys 23 to 33 yeah. and the terrible examples was the same exact same age range yeah. and i realized that there were guys married with three kids that were living totally the opposite way you'd want to live at that point in your life and career and that's when it hit me it was just like you got to find the guys that are doing and have achieved the things that you want to achieve and i remember coming in uh to the league and i remember i used to watch um Chris Holt, Vinny Fuller, Cortland Finnegan. I remember every Wednesday, uh, uh, C. Hope and, and Vinny Fuller would come in and they'd wear like jeans and nothing crazy or fancy, but you know, for the most part, we mm-hmm. wear our sweats, sweats and all that. And I'm like, why are they, like, where are you dressing up to go? <laughs> and I remember every Wednesday, they used to go to Mount Zion to go to Bible study yeah. mm-hmm. after they were done that. at the facility. And I was just like, Wow, and they would watch film when we were done with our day with our DB coach up until uh, 6.45, and then they'd take the 15-minute drive to go to Mount Zion uh, Baptist Church to, to listen uh, to Bible study. And to me, that was the cool thing. See, Hope got in a cold tub every day after practice, so I got in a cold tub every day after practice. And I used to look at him and, and guys like Cortland and Vinny. Vinny was a guy that uh, he played seven years in the league, didn't get a huge contract, but was a guy that you respected. You know, he treated people with respect. See, Hope was a guy that was in his eighth year, won a Super Bowl, got a big contract. And Cortland was a guy that was a seventh round draft pick that worked his way to a starter, was a community man of the year. So I'm looking like these are the guys that, that if I had to fast forward my career, I want to be able to win a Super Bowl. I want to make a Pro Bowl. I want to yeah. be respected in the community. I want to be going to Bible study, getting closer with God. And I followed those guys. and. Um, it wasn't always asking them questions. Sometimes it was just doing what they were doing. Yeah. Whenever they were lifting, I would go lift. And mm-hmm. you really didn't have to ask those guys questions because whenever I was around them, somebody was telling a story yeah. and I was just picking up listening to it. Man, it's it's, good. it's, it's so special that, that life comes around full mm-hmm. circle. You know, I had a lot of great mentors. I can go from Champ Bailey to Brian Dawkins. But I think about one guy and it kind of puts me in the mode of like how we are three family men, mm-hmm. you know, we have our parties and like a guy named Andre Davis who brought me in, yeah. single guy, his wife, his three daughters. And he, before he brought me in, he was like, Wes, like, what do you want to do in life? What do you want to mm-hmm. be in life? And I looked at him and I'm like, Dre, like, this is a perfect picture. Your family is like, this is what I want. So man, I just commend you guys to continue to be that great example of what it is to be a godly man and most importantly being godly brothers that hold each other accountable. And, and, and I think that's the scary thing about this world. Men are afraid to hold each other accountable, mm-hmm. and you guys will get a chance. You guys had that chance to do that this past year, and I just think that's special that you were in the same locker room. Yeah. Same that's goes to you, man. You've been a captain yeah. everywhere. You've been <laughs> for a reason, man. That's good. Let's close it with this, and it's the same question for both of you on the podcast. We'll start with Dev. The last 12 months, you kind of alluded to 12 months ago, Jay, so we'll keep it in the last year here. I know March 15th was the day that you were traded. Mm-hmm. What is God, what's the biggest lesson that you've learned from God 
in this last year, Dev, start with you. The biggest lesson that Christ has kind of uh, instilled on your heart over this last year that you've learned? Um, I would say move out the way, um, myself move out the way and humble myself in, in situations, especially at home. Um, I would say move out the ways because I always thought I could get this, you know, get my brother here, win games, do what we do at the Patriots. And, you know, you go through this year and it's like, we lose two games on the road right away. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh man, I'm I'm in the locker room like, man, we can't be the guys that blow this whole thing up and not win. And, but, <laughs> and it's kind of like, he was like, hey man, like I'm gonna, I'm gonna create a different way this year. Like it's not gonna go as you plan. Like it, each time, like we went out there on the field, like I didn't play the way I wanted to play. And we will win and I'd be like, man, my wife be like, it's okay. And I'm like, nah, I'm not playing the way I want. And he'd be like, bro, we winning. Like, what are you talking <laughs> about? And um, I thought this year was a great example of that. And I would say second home of myself is just when I'm at home and my wife says certain things and I get defensive and, I'm, and, it, and at times I'm like, man, or like she wouldn't read the devotional. And I'm like, she like, you got to remind me. I'm like, nah, you got to do your part in me. And I'm like, man, who do you think you are? You know, like you, mm -hmm. if you need a reminder that helps out, then do that. You know, yeah. let them work through you to her and mm -hmm. don't think like you yeah. all high almighty now because you went to a PAO and you come back and you're reading your, your, your devotional plan daily. Yeah. Like, um, and then you get reminded being back down here again to talk about discipling and, and helping others. So, um, you know, I thought what we just heard from Aeneas, you know, he's Aeneas always Williams. talking. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, really, that opened me up too today. It's good. Jay, how about uh, you? Biggest lesson that God's taught you in the last year? Man, it's been uh, stick with me and, and, and I got you. And uh, I remember just I, sometimes dealing with just anxiety before games, that anxiousness, and um, that'll just trouble you and a good word will make you glad. I remember reading that uh, mm -hmm. through our, our Bible studies and not only these last 12 months, but kind of the last three years of since I left Tennessee of, of just not knowing where next was going to be and and unsure and, and and not really knowing like not really trusting in him and and worrying a lot about him and then going to cleveland and trying to do it on my own and uh, having a little bit of personal success but the team um not doing well and just everything just dragging me down and and allowing it to drag me down and fast forward to get to new england and it wasn't all rainbows when i got there you know i got injured in the spring didn't do any otas any mini camp Every time I talk to the media, it's why aren't you doing anything? Yeah. Um, article after article, McCourty's not on the bubble, may not make it past training camp. You get to the fourth preseason game. I'm playing in the fourth preseason game in the second half. I remember after the game, I remember saying to Dev at halftime, like, Man, it was fun while it lasted. Like, who right. knows what's going to happen? You <laughs> yeah. know what I mean? And having to answer all the questions in the media. And like I said, dealing with family, with my wife and our kids at home, of the frustrations of not meeting my wife's needs. and being so frustrated because I'm thinking she's not meeting my needs that I'm not even attempting to meet her on her side and mm. going through all of that. And I think um, growing so much over these last seven, eight months with her and, and with our team chaplain and everybody there with our couples Bible study, um, he just keeps saying to me, like, continue to trust on me and I'll carry you through. And when I got to knowing, I never, and he's telling me, I'll do things that you can't even imagine. I never would have <laughs> imagined. And I, when I got there, everybody was just like, man, come on, man. Like, this is Jay's chance to win a ring. And being in the league, you know how hard it is just to get there. So being able to get there, and uh, this will be the last thing I said. I think I was telling you guys about it yeah. um, a little bit. I was talking about it in our, our core groups. And um, when we won the AFC Championship game, getting ready for that Super Bowl, and as you know, you played in the Super Bowl, and you know so many people are texting, congrats, yeah. man, yeah. good luck, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. The, the common theme I kept getting from when I went to the grocery store or anything is, man, you deserve this. You've worked so hard for this opportunity, man. You deserve this. You deserve this. And at some point I said to my wife, Melissa, I was just like, I don't deserve this. Like, what have I done that I deserve a championship more than a Wesley Royer, yeah. more than a Jarrell Casey that we played with in Tennessee? There's so many guys that are living a lot better than me or not, whatever the case may be. There's nothing that we're doing here to get the love and the mercy and the grace that we get from God. Yeah. But we take it in and we have to spread it and talk about it. And that just hit me. And I was just like, I was sitting there and I, I had to stop myself from 
yeah, I do deserve this. I need mm-hmm. to win a championship. I had to kind of pause and stop myself and say, just be grateful. Be honored and blessed that you're on this stage, you have this platform, and you're getting this opportunity uh, to be able to do this. That's good. Devin McCourty, Jason McCourty, thank you for joining us here on the podcast. Wesley Wood, you're pretty good. Oh, man. Pretty good fun. host. You yeah, might have to do this right? This guy's pretty good. Guys, thank you. No problem. Appreciate it.